Man, these are fun. All right. So everything's running, and I think that it's only acceptable to have a stream start with a bunch of awkward non-beginning material. Looks like we're live. All right. Excellent. So again, there's, it's a really cool day today. Uh, it's the last Sunday of April and the last day of April. And as per my channel's wonderful thing that we're doing is that we take a time out every single month to thank our wonderful subscribers whom we just got 20,000 of just a few minutes ago. Woo, oh, sorry, not 20, sorry, 19, 19,000. Congratulations. Still, uh, 19,000 subscribers, it's really exciting. And today I want to share the wonderful expertise and personality of Christy Winters, who is a YouTuber who is, uh, how do I even, how would you even describe the kind of work you do? You do so much stuff. Uh, yeah, I guess it's just a channel where I do the things that I'm interested in. And what I'm interested in is more uh, sort of the nexus of atheism and feminism, also social science. I'm a progressive myself, and so American politics has consumed a lot of my content lately. So yeah, basically, uh, my YouTube channel are the things that I care about and or am interested in. Nice. And uh, yeah, you're like, you are in the academic sphere, you're a political scientist and... That's true. Yes, I, um, I'm a, an actual political scientist. I have the title and the piece of paper and everything. And I'm, I'm also um, running a qualitative study in the UK. I have been since 2010 when I founded the study, where we're doing uh, a cross series of, of elections. We're interviewing Britons, ordinary people, to hear them about, talk about politics and what they care about, what they're paying attention to, what they think of the leaders, what, where they want to see their country going. And then we take that data and we prepare it in a way to make it easier for other social scientists or other sociologists or anybody else, historians maybe, in 150 years to use. Uh, and we deposit that in an archive to make it freely available. So yeah, I do, I do social science. <laughs> nice. So we're getting, like, uh, you're getting, is this a direct result of the, the writ being dropped last week or is this beforehand? No, it's definitely a complete reaction to the snap election. So it, that was the question, right? Because I think I yeah, dropped yeah. out a little bit. Right. So, you know, in the last uh, government, when they formed the coalition, the conservatives and the liberal Democrats in the UK created a bill called the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. And they decided, OK, we're not going to do these snap elections anymore unless something happens. Um, we're going to plan them out and have them every five years more like the American system, you know, than I was used to. And I was really happy because I love doing my research. I, I'm really lucky that I get to research topics that I care about. But it was supposed to happen in 2020. So when it happened two years after I've just, it was literally in the last couple months that we've deposited our data from the last election. I was like, okay, good. Now I can start writing. <laughs> <laughs> now I've done all my data collection and I've deposited it. I can um, now start writing up my research now. So yeah, that's going to have to wait. Wow. So like, yeah, because this is going to be a weird election, I imagine, with um, it's the first post-apocalyptic election. So it's like going to be right. who's going to be the first uh, independent prime minister, the first non-European mm -hmm. prime minister. Um, and also it's the age of... Like ever since uh, since the last election, you had I think Corbyn take over the, the the Labour Party, and that's probably a whole thing. And I imagine that the SNP has a pretty good strategy going on right now. That for everybody who isn't who's in the chat, the SNP is the Scottish Separatist Party. So uh, I forgot. I don't want to yes. get into jargon, but. Um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating. And we had already decided because of, uh, we did data collection after the Indy referendum, the Indy ref, independence referendum. And we did um, then the election data collection. And then after the Brexit vote, we didn't, we didn't get funding for Brexit, but several of our panelists agreed to be interviewed. And we had about an even division of remainers and leavers. So we have data on all of that. Um, and we knew going into whatever the next election was going to be that our real core research question was going to be identity. Because 
you know, that was the thing that we wanted to really unpack a bit more and understand, you know, Scottish notions of identity and people who are British living in Scotland, people who are born in Scotland, uh, do they consider themselves more Scottish than British or more British than Scottish? And then there's issues, you know, like uh, Welsh identity with the rise of Welsh language and there's more of a, I mean, Plaid Cymru, uh, which is the Welsh party, the party for the nation of Wales, isn't quite on par with like the SNP in terms of its dominance, but they still have a quite big um, adherence in, in Wales. So identity is definitely going to be the issue we are going to be trying to unpack when we listen to voters coming up in the next few weeks. Yeah, it, it's, um, okay, yeah, there's a mouthful there, but uh, you kind of hit on something that I find that's really interesting about nationalism in general. And it makes me think about how there's this like thing of people talking about like Brexit was a nationalist movement and how Trump is like a nationalist movement and Marine Le Pen is like one. And, but yet like, uh, you know, if, if this is like your first taste of like, you know, radical nationalist politics, it's really strange because like I always associated nationalism in the last few decades with like, left le leftist but like left-leaning politics of like you know the independence movements in the developing world or uh movements like um uh like nasserism and uh in my own home country the quebecois independence mm -hmm. movement or um even the scottish the scottish yeah. independence movement is very much uh not Ooh, like, yeah you, yeah and you I, it's interesting so it's like what you might know more than me. what's going on. What's, what's the, what would separate, say, like uh, a Brexit lever type nationalist and say a Scottish nationalist? I think, you know, from what our data indicates from from, from the people who participated, the, the people who were in favor of, of exiting really just they, they, they felt like um, their sovereignty had been transferred, that they wanted the ability to make local decisions. There were concerns about the rates of immigration. You, you hear it if you go to the UK, you know, people love to moan about lots of things, including the weather, um, but also public transportation and increasingly housing. And there are all of these pressures. And part of the, you know, there's one might say there's a lack of investment in the various things like infrastructure to meet that demand. So people end up getting squeezed. It is, it is a small island. You know, there's a, there's what 63 million people living in in Britain, and um, and that feeling of being crushed. If you've lived anywhere around London, which is itself is like, well, last time I checked, seven million people. You're constantly in a, you know, like there are people everywhere. Uh, you can get the impression that everywhere is crowded because of immigration and that's not necessarily the case but it's an easy perception to have so it's sort of that look it's our nhs our taxes we're doing this we should take care of our own first we should look to our own country before europe and so it's pretty much just a center a, a position of in my opinion of, of values of where do you distribute your resources and of course, you know, there was the bus that was going around saying, hey, you know, the money that we send to Europe, we could be spending that money on healthcare. And even though it wasn't an accurate statement, it's a compelling one. <laughs> so, um, so that was the side, uh, you know, trying to just sort of generally, like, there were a lot of individuals who had a lot of different perspectives. But concern about uh, immigration and population uh, growth and those things definitely came up in our focus groups. On the, on the remainer side, I think there are people who, uh, they tended to be, be people who are more outward and globalist in their attitudes. So, uh, and so they, they saw integration as a positive. They saw like the movement of people or, and things as a benefit that you get to bring in the best people. And then also Britons can go and get jobs in other parts of Europe where maybe they wouldn't have the opportunity um, in uh, there. And it was just less of a, concern about the things that the, the people who articulated their remain views um, and so they felt like immigration wasn't such a problem they felt like there were other ways to deal with the strains on the NHS or on public transportation than leaving uh, the EU and they didn't have that kind of concern about sovereignty and moving 
keeping power in Parliament. I mean that too. I mean that 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 notion. If you go to Scotland, you talk about it's really keep important to keep power at Westminster, and they're like, you know, we should be leaving. Some people would be like, well, you know, you can make the same argument on the Scottish level that we're not getting the the sovereignty that we want, and they're making decisions and imposing them on us, and we want our freedom as well. So. It's a slightly, you know, slippery slope argument when you start going that way. But but generally, it's it's a it's a conflict of of values that underpins most political dilemmas or dis, uh, disagreements. And this this was no different. Yeah, it almost seems like a uh, nationalism as like a political movement always seems to be more of a why than a what. Yeah. And because like you can. You can, uh, as you can, as we've seen, as we are seeing, and hopefully um, in May we won't see that, or June for the UK, it's May for France, but that you can have nationalism that's motivating hard authoritarian type of stuff, but then also, like, I don't know if anyone would argue that, say, well, no one would argue that, say, like the the Quebecois, the Parti Quebecois is like a hard right nationalist movement or that the SNP is one. Yeah, certainly I can't speak to the Quebecois, but when, when it comes to our participants who are SNP, they were very concerned about the increases of people who were needing the food banks. They were really in um, upset about the various disability checks that the conservative uh, liberal democrat coalition had imposed on people they were it, they basically like the people who were in our groups they see the job of the state as to take the wealth and redistribute it so that people are taken care of um and that's so that was the priorities that they they don't want to spend money on trident it wasn't their value system they would rather see that money going to education training for young people who don't have jobs than to go to you know another nuclear submarine and the challenge for the those people in scotland is that you know they can vote they had voted sometimes in families for generation for labor again and again and again but because of the way that the vote the population is distributed they got a, a conservative government again and again and again and so they were never getting the representation that they felt ref reflected their values now this of course was somewhat offset by the notion of devolution that certain powers were Put, uh, pushed down to or given over to the nation of uh, Scotland or the nation of Wales. They have an assembly. Scotland has a parliament. Um, but in some ways, all this does is further fuel the separation, right? So you get some of the values then being implemented by the Scottish parliament, but you still have the military spending and the, the way that the tax structure is organized at the Westminster level. So you get a little taste of independence, but it's still not quite the government you want. And so it's, it's um, you know, like they don't have quite a federal system and they don't have now a, a total like a Westminster model anymore. They've got a really hodgepodge version that's kind of, well, Britain, Britain's whole history has been just like an organic growth of path dependency where one decision then kind of leads them down another path. Um, but yeah, it was in Scotland, it's definitely the SNP is far more motivated, you know, from the left and about inclusiveness rather than the authoritarian, which is more of a protectionist approach. That's a, it, it, it's, that's a whole lot to chew on. I, I imagine you've got your work cut out for you. Well, in some ways my job is easy because I just have to listen. Um, you know, um, a few a, a sign of a good focus group moderator is that they basically speak in order to keep the conversation going. And I do that a lot on my show is people come on and they say, oh, you know, don't let me talk too much. I'm like, that's fine. I can just sit here and drink my drink and like enjoy you talking. That's what I do. But um, we for the study, like any what you call longitudinal study or repeated study over time, we pretty much ask the same questions because we want one, you know, there are basic things that you just ask about any election. Are you paying attention to the campaign? What do you think of the party leaders? What do you think of the party? What do you think of, um, what are the most important issues facing you? What are the dynamics in your constituency, you know, that might influence how you will vote? How, how can you best express you know, what you want to see happen through your vote? And uh, we also did stuff on the debates. And so the questions themselves sort of stay the same. It's the characters and the situations that change around the question. And that's what we're hoping to kind of capture at each of these elections is uh, people, when they tell well, okay, so in, in our article in Parliamentary Affairs, we proposed that we could look at qualitative data, focus group data, in one of two ways. 
One is people are being honest and sincere. They're actually sitting, when they sit down in the focus groups, they're giving you, to the best of their ability, an account of their behaviors that is accurate to what they perceive happened right because it's not objective it's it's subjective but they're being honest the other option is that they're just lying to you let's assume that everything they say is a lie when they get in the room even if they're lying to your face they still have to draw on a set of common social norms and customs and languages and practices that everybody understands all right so if you came into a, you want to tell a story about um, how you won at poker and it was a complete lie you're not going to talk about getting blackjack in a poker game because everyone will know that you're talking crap right so even if they're lying they still have to work within the british political culture and in discourse and so they'll have to draw on certain norms and values within that discourse to make sense of it so e even if you don't take their comments as being truthful they're still working within that that British politics world and they're creating those those stories with those values so we can understand how people express or relate those things and then compare them I generally think that you know our focus groups our, our participants are anonymous and their information is confidential and and after a, like 30 minutes because we do turn taking so everyone has an opportunity and we also say look anyone you're not here to you know, to have a debate. It's fine if you disagree. If if someone there's someone you disagree with, don't look at them. Look at me and tell me what you disagree with, because we don't want to increase. You know, we don't want to, people feel bad for saying something. Um, and what we find is that you know people do express very sincere opinions. And and actually in the post election groups, there were several people who had been uh, labor voters. Uh, one particular gentleman I'm thinking of was on disability. And he had been on disability because of his illness for a while, and he was really concerned about what was going to happen to him in the next election and got sort of choked up about um, facing that fear. Another woman in a different group, also a labor supporter, she knew that if the government um, went um, to the conservatives in 2015, she'd probably lose her job. So she came to the focus group and got a little bit upset because this was she was now worried about how she was going to deal with the fact that how am I going to prepare if this happens? So, you know, there's a lot of sincerity that comes through in the stories and people feel that these, these focus groups are a place where if they say something, they're going to be heard. And also it's going to be recorded and put down into the archives. So that's going to be data that will be there for other people to research. So they know that what they're saying is making a contribution. Um, I'm kind of off tangent now, but I think the actual process of collecting the data is sometimes, um, you know, as interesting as the data that comes out of it because of, the, what you have to think about um, in order to get people to feel like they can open up to you like that. Yeah, I imagine that uh, it's important work at this point because I think that if I were to like, if you look at the things that are going on in the UK, it's like there's like some crux points that the UK probably hasn't faced in centuries. And this is probably hundreds of years from now going to be known as a kind of interesting turnaround point. Like when Brexit first passed, um, I remember hearing stuff, and I don't know, maybe in the UK this was like, you know, maybe this is way overblown outside, but I remember hearing like issues with the like integrity of the United Kingdom. There was talk about Northern Ireland and Scotland and Gibraltar and like things that, you know, had been conquered with sailing ships and cannons uh, leaving. And it's just, what? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that identity and that in integrity is is the challenge going forward because there are you know people pulling in different directions now, not only in Scotland, um, but you know like the whole whether to, to stay or go. And there's a lot of people who are remain who just aren't quite convinced that they're you know like they understand that the process of leaving has happened, but they kind of still don't want it to be true. So if, if there's ways to undermine it or, you know, have run, munchy, the, uh, monkey wrenches thrown into it, they'll be perfectly happy to see that happen. I actually think I saw on Facebook right before I came on that May said something along the lines of there needing to be another referendum to confirm any EU agreement. Um, if that's accurate, if I'm remembering that accurately, that would be huge because then you'd be voting on, ugh, I don't, I don't want to go back into the field. <laughs> I don't want yeah, to do I, 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 I imagine the snap election has less to do with that and more to do with Theresa May realizing that whatever hope the Tories have for hanging on to a government is highest now before the real bad stuff starts yeah. happening. I agree. And it was a complete about face because when she was running, like the thing that made me most excited about her was she said, we're going to keep our commitment to the five-year 
parliament as it's, it's, it's you know because won't someone think of the social scientist won't someone think of the political scientist kidding obviously um but uh yeah and then she's you're you're right because as these negotiations go on it's not going to get easier right so and if they get a bum deal at the end of it they could get booted out just because of the deal they negotiated or the you know how people perceive it so doing it now she gets to push back from 2020 to what 2022 having to go back to the voters uh to for a reckoning so i think she's yeah her time. and she's unelected and so that probably has some legitimacy issues and I imagine that there's a lot of people in the Tory camp who are legitimately terrified of Prime Minister Jeremy Corbyn. Oh uh, no, I don't know. Well, two things. One is, um, you know, it's you know, and you know this. It's different um, in the UK because they don't elect leaders; they elect parties. So, mm -hmm. for instance, Gordon Brown took over for Tony Blair, and nobody considered him illegitimate or felt like you know he he should have called a snap election earlier. Um, he could have anyway, and he chose not to. Uh, but I get that actually a lot in focus groups. Um, because, you know, obviously I've got an American accent and I'm honest about it. And in some ways it plays to my advantage because I don't have a natural whole, I don't have a political history there and I'm an outsider. So people can, they don't feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like I'm talking to a labor voter or a labor supporter who's running this focus group. Um, but, oh dang, now I forgot the, the point I was going to make. <laughs> what were we talking about? Sorry. Uh, about Tories being afraid of Jeremy Corbyn oh, becoming prime minister. Right. So, um, Corbyn is... Um, not, he's a very divisive person within the Labour Party, the Labour Party, and I know a lot of my friends are Corbynites, and I love my friends, and I wish the best for them, but if you just look at the numbers, the Conservatives really don't have to worry about Labour, because um, Labour was wiped out in Scotland, and from the most recent data I've seen, the real challenge to the SNP is more to be the Conservatives than Labour. So labor is really out there. Um, and then you've got they're you know playing for for England and maybe some seats in Wales, but you just like the math doesn't work. So I think that they're really pretty safe. Now, obviously, that's why we have elections because you never know what's going to happen. But I would be very surprised if if she didn't increase her majority. So. okay. yeah, I, I, it it's actually fairly similar. like um, I always thought when I saw Theresa May get elected or get um, appointed the leadership of the, the Tories, I had a flashback. Well, not a real flashback because I was alive, but I was a baby when this happened. But um, it's, it's um, the ill-fated story of our first female prime minister, our first and only female prime minister. And I imagine that is the same idea. Do you know the story about Kim Campbell? Is she the person who came into office to cover somebody else's? I was talking with somebody else about this, but I might be getting it wrong. So why don't we just go for it? Yeah, let's go from the beginning. Yeah. So Kim Campbell, uh, so when, when everybody in the world was getting into their shoulder pads and uh, trickle-down economics in the 80s, <laughs> our version of that was a wonderful um, monster named Brian Mulrooney. And he... Uh, basically ran uh, like most of the, you know, 80s conservative leaders, uh, their countries into the ground by the end of the late 80s. And the progressive conservative party was en route to have what would be likely called a disaster uh, in the next election. So all of a sudden, Brian Mulroney uh, resigned to give the leadership to his deputy PM, Kim Campbell, who to this day is the only female, the only woman to be the Prime Minister of Canada. She was the leader for about 30 or 40 days, uh, ran a campaign where uh, she was pro-NAFTA, where Canada was super against NAFTA, and made fun of the Prime Minister for having, uh, a, the, or sorry, made fun of the um, liberal running against her for having a partially paralyzed face. Oh, right. Because uh, mm. if you remember, uh, if you if you remember, good old um, Jean Chrétien, he had like a part, like half his face was paralyzed, and he he made some. He did it made a very Jean Chrétien line. He said, "Well, at least I'm talking out of one side of my mouth and not both sides." And, um, <laughs> very good. And he uh, that election though, uh, the PCs got reduced to three seats uh, from having a majority, and the Liberals had an overwhelming majority government with a 
with the Bloc Québécois being the official opposition. Right. And we had a wow. referendum in 1995, probably as a direct result. Yeah, I remember the referendum. I actually do remember that happening. Um, yeah, so. I, anytime anyone asks me, what's the earliest historical event you remember? I remembered the 1995 referendum. I would have been like six, but or five, okay. almost six. <laughs> but Right, for me, it would have been Reagan getting shot. Reagan getting shot. Yeah, oh. I was I was on the playground. I was literally on the playground at lunch, and someone rang it up and like, Reagan got shot. I'm like, really? And then we all went inside and we watched news in the, like, not really an assembly area, but in a sort of like, yeah, place where they took the students to watch movies and stuff. Yeah, so that's that would have been a that would have been a crazy moment to live through because it's just like the the president got shot. Now to explain what happened, has anyone seen the movie Taxi Driver? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, they had, you know, the news was out pretty quickly that he walked into the emergency room, who wasn't wheeled in, and um, then there was a lot of kind of like playing down of how serious it was until afterwards, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, they had the, the transfer of power and stuff, and so, yeah, it was, there was a lot that happened. Um, yeah, it's known as like the different. first major test of, what, the 22nd Amendment? Or yeah, I think. Um, okay, well, off the top of my head, I don't have them all memorized, but that sounds about right. It's probably in the 20s. <laughs> but was, yeah, the one yeah. that has the official transfer of power in times of the president's incapacity. Yeah, I think they would put it in after, um, after Eisenhower had a heart attack in the office, and they were like, oh, okay, we need to have rules about this. Right, like, we don't have a way to transfer power. Yeah, so we need to sort this, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Then they made a West Wing episode about it. <laughs> you know, I was actually working in politics when the West Wing was on. And so the last thing I wanted to do was come home from the Capitol and watch more politics. Uh, so but it's probably, I'm probably far enough away from it now to go back and watch it. But all my friends rave, rave about the West Wing. I was like, oh, I couldn't do it. So I should go back. <laughs> I am. And you also mentioned some stuff about, oh, what was it? There's like problems with the uh, the way that devolution and everything works or uh, with um, the kind of electoral structure with um, representation because yeah, we were just dealing with that here too. Yes. So um, Britain, like, well, um, um, you know, the, the states as well are first past the post or winner takes all is the American way of saying it. And so, yeah, you get um, people, you, you end up getting um, basically like it, it tends to go to a two party system. If you have first past the post, then you tend to get a two party system. They call it a two and a half party system. But generally the, the seat distribution um, well, for a while it was favoring uh, labor when they could actually get elected. But at the moment, it's not just like the seat distribution. It's the fact, I think, that the SNP just did so well in Scotland. They swept, I think, all but three constituencies, and they ended up with over 50 people. And to just, you've got the power of incumbency, and it's also only been two years, so Labour hasn't had a big chance to clean up its reputation. There were a lot of people um, in our focus groups men and women from different cities who said, you know, my family's been Labour, I voted Labour, but this time I'm voting for SNP because I think we need a Scottish voice in Westminster. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's, it's, so there's one, the first past the post thing, which leads to two party systems. And then there's also the, the drawing of the boundaries for the constituencies. But then there's this, now this sort of new undercurrent of parties that are, you know, are popping, uh, taking power in, in ways that they haven't before. Yeah, it's strange because it's happened and uh, it's happening here too. Um, and I think that maybe for like Americans watching this, this is like a little bit more uh, difficult to understand that there's really big issue. Like, yeah, the winner take all elections in America are not great, but yeah. at least like, <laughs> you know, at least every election is like a 41, 50 or 49, 51 election there in a lot of cases when like here uh, we have five, political parties who have seats. And I think that we've had situations like the worst situation we ever had. And this was where we had a call for, uh, we had a call for uh, popular or sorry, uh, proportional representation after the 2011 election, where we got a majority government out of 39% of the popular vote. Well, yeah, um, yeah, and yes, sometimes the conservatives give about that much and yet they get the full majority of parliament. Uh, because of the seat distribution, yeah. And so people feel like their vote doesn't count. 
you know, so whereas with the with the party system, like you guys have, if you form coalitions, there's a better chance of your policies actually, you know, getting into a government than if it's a yes, no choice. Oh, it's even better than that, because what happened here is that the conservatives have run a really good PR campaign to sow toxicity over the concept of a cons of a coalition government. Oh, right. Because so they know that, yeah, because right, Canada's got a split power. left. Yeah. And so, like, there was talk when the conservatives were getting, like, three minority governments in a row, if, like, you know, the liberals and the uh, new Democrats who are our social Democrats could just like, you know, form a coalition and not deal with uh, this new, uh, cause the conservative party was two parties and then they merged in 2003. We had a progressive conservative party that basically died in that election I was talking to you about. And then like a more radical right wing um, kind of prairie focused party, like an Alberta focused party that loves oil and, um, oil and tar sands and Alberta and oil. And okay. <laughs> they got, uh, they merged and that's when, that's what Stephen Harper came out of. Right. He was actually part of that party. The Alliance was their name. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know why I'm just like deciding that Canadian political history has to be the, the, <laughs> the thing I want to talk about. It's the politics that I know the best, I guess, but. Um, well, no, that makes sense. You talk about what you know, right? And that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, uh, the the toxicity towards coalition governments, and then also the precipitous or not the meteoric rise of our Green Party. Which when, has about, when did that start really taking off? In the two thousands, in the oddies, mm -hmm. uh, they have one seat because um, the leader of the party who gets to, who got to go to the debates a few elections ago. Uh, she runs an extremely locally focused campaign in Vancouver and has her one seat. And that's like the one green party seat, but they get like 10% of the national vote and get one seat. And that's, um, that's yeah, a bit messed up. You know, that that's, you know, I know, so voting systems are really complicated and people usually know the ones, you know, like the ones they grow up with are the ones they're most familiar with and think are usually the best, but um, yeah, they've tried actually, you know, there's a lot of different ways to vote. Like the, there's, um, there's, you get two votes for the par uh, Scottish Parliament, where you get a like a list vote of one of the parties, and then you get an open vote. And they have you know like different order preferences in the layer London mayor voting, and of course uh, people when they were in when they were in the EU when you had British elections for the EU, you get then like various ways of ranking. And I have to say, if you ever want to see like an unfathomable way of calculating votes and seats. Just look at any EU election. It is crazy. Like the first time I was in the, in Britain for an actual EU vote where they were sending their, their re representatives to Brussels and they have this complicated math formula. Like if you get so many votes, then you automatically get the first thing and then there's like a division and it's so complicated. But a lot of people, at least in, in the UK, like the idea of PR uh, because especially when we heard from uh, UKIP voters who were upset that over in 2015, about 4 million people cast votes for UKIP across the country, but they only got one seat. Mm -hmm. yeah, so a similar situation. And that seems very, to them, you know, they have a, a case about uh, democracy and representation. Uh, so every system is flawed, but some, you know, um, produce, more, you know, all of them produce outcomes because it's created by human beings that ends up with contention. But yeah, um, there are better ways than first past the post. Um, there are also way more complicated ways that I would not recommend. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like when you hear about like the Byzantine system they have in like New Zealand or uh, the best system, obviously, is where you take every state or province and give them uh, one for every uh, one for every representative and senator. And then you elect a group of people that you don't know about to go a month after the election to one place where they then get to vote if they choose to follow the state that they want to go with. And then um, if that's a tie, then you get the Senate to vote for the vice president and <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that system. <laughs> yeah, that's a really well thought out system. <laughs> um, yeah, I remembered, uh, I think you were, I was just watching one of your videos uh, earlier this week and you were talking about John Oliver 
And I just remember the last episode of that being like, man, isn't it weird when the presidential election actually has like a big sense in some way? Right. Imagine that. Like the people who do the two top candidates go forward and then you get to choose. To that. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, there's um, voting in the states is, well, first, it's just the, the ability to get access to the ballot. You know, voter suppression is an issue that I don't know is, I'm sure it happens in other places too, but um, certainly as an American, voter suppression and people being um, having obstacles put in their way to get to the ballot box itself is a problem. But then, yeah, there are just basic things that we could, I mean, I, okay, I'm just going to say this. I would personally like to see um, Democrats elected uh, with the agenda to pass uh, a, like a federal, a new federal voting act that would regulate federal elections, right? Because in the constitution, it sets the date that the, the election will be held. And um, like the first Tuesday after the first Monday of the month kind of thing. So there, Congress does have the power to set its own election schedule. I would like to see uniform federal elections held on like weekends instead of, that might take a constitutional amendment, but weekends rather than on a Tuesday, um, Saturday and Sunday. I would also like to see uh, six weeks of early absentee voting and basically a uniform way of registering to vote and also um, securing the vote so that, you know, people, even though voting fraud's not a problem, but where if people show up with proof of residency, you know, their, their gas bill or their phone bill or their mobile bill now, um, that, that as long as they're registered, that that's sufficient. And if they have voter um, ID, they can do same day registration. And I think that should be the same across all the states. I think the states could still have like their own primary systems and decide how the lists go and everything else. But I would like to see, at least on the federal level, because you couldn't really do it at the states, um, really protecting the vote and making it uniform and with the goal of it being accessible. And that, to me, would would be a really big, important reform. That'd be great. Yeah, I um, I was the electoral stories are the the voter suppression stories in America are so strange because like I remembered um we passed an electoral reform system that was basic or um like there was like an attempt to do some voter suppression with uh with the Tory government from 2011 to 2015 or is like any Canadian now referred to as like the dark times um but one of the things they try to do and this is like a thing that they try to get rid of that in America would be unthinkable, which was having vouching as part of, as your ID. So if you are, if you don't have any form of ID, but you do have proof of residence, you can get somebody who knows you to mm -hmm. vouch for you and say, this is the guy. Um, and when they pass, when they try to get rid of that, because it would be unfair towards uh, people who don't have ID specifically, uh, native Canadians who live in extremely rural areas who can't just like go home and pick up their card and come back because they might have driven like three hours to a polling station. Yeah. It's, yeah, but uh, th still like I remembered I moved in the last election and I and didn't tell them and didn't register and was able to register and vote at the polls on the day that I, on the election day. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if you look at the actual cases of voter fraud, they're very in-person voter fraud is incredibly rare. Uh, and, and I also in Wisconsin, I don't the law's probably changed now because we've had Republicans running it and they've been working to change the law. But when I was at university, it was the same thing where you could have um, there was a form. There was a place on the form where it was um, if someone was vouching for your identity, they had to print their name and then give their signature and they had to live in that district. So that was the other thing. Like if, if you were at the polling booth and someone came up and you're like, hey, Fred, how you doing? How you doing? Uh, OK, Fred, let me see your ID. Oh. I, I forgot to bring it. I didn't bring anything with me. Like, well, Bill, can you vouch for Fred? Yeah, I can vouch for Fred. You know, so you, you, you couldn't just be a random person off the street vouching for you. It had to be somebody who lived in the same voting district. But yeah, that was on the form that you could do that. And again, you don't have election outcomes being turned on in-person voter fraud. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. And I mean, America has a third of a billion people. Like, you're not going to, yeah. no one's going to be able to put, <laughs> and also every state runs its own elections. There's so many different systems. Like, you would have to be a mastermind to yeah. undermine. To systematically. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, if you wanted to rig an election, we already learned how to do it. And that is... Uh, get in, uh, which is basically social engineering, start 
sewing mm-hmm. descent online and uh or uh, yeah other, and also you know, Oh, well, the, what they do like in Texas is that if you have a concealed carry permit, that is sufficient to prove prove your ID to vote. But if you're a college student, your student ID with your p- picture on it, even though it's issued by the university, which is a state agency <laughs> or a state institution, isn't considered legal ID to vote. Uh, they take away souls to the polls on Sunday voting so that African Americans who normally use that as their traditional get out the vote day can no longer do that. Um, they put more polling places you know, in rural areas than they do in urban ones, so that there are longer lines and fewer resources. So it's these kind of Jim Crow laws that get, oh, don't even get, yeah, I'm gonna get on a yeah. rant here, so. So, um, there's not that, that, on this like thing, that's because uh, I didn't understand a lot of the American system when I was following, 2016 is probably the election I followed the most in depth. Uh, I've followed elections before, but, uh, that one was the one where I was like, you know, every single day I was seeing stuff that was happening, mostly because um, when I went to my undergraduate school, it was a tiny university in rural Quebec, but it was 20 minutes from the border with Vermont. And oh, right. um, due to a certain filibuster that happened in 2010, I've developed a crush on a certain politician, a certain senator <laughs> from Vermont. And so I was really following along with that. Yeah. Um, well, I just remembered that uh, there was stuff that came up, and this is, you know, this is not in the government system. This is the the, the primary caucusing system, mm-hmm. where there was stuff like coin flips deciding delegates and really, really long lines in places like Arizona and a lot yeah. of the point where some people sued, but I know in America people sue a lot, so I don't know if that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so and that, um, yeah, I mean, that's all that's all right. And part of the problem is that it is local county clerks who have limited budgets. And, you know, they basically try to figure out how many vote, how many ballots to print so that they print enough for election day, but they don't print so many that they waste the money because that money could be used for issuing marriage licenses or doing other stuff that the county needs. And so the under resourced nature of the elections too end up being a problem and contribute to those long lines. Um, as well. So. so does the money for things like caucuses and primaries come out of the government or come out of the parties? So, I mean, I, I don't, I can only speak to my experience from the state of Wisconsin, but yeah, the county clerks in every county are like responsible for uh, organizing the, you know, the elections uh, at that level. And so they have, they have to kind of figure out where the wards are and, and um, where the, the, polling places should be located and organized. Usually that's like they hire people and they're usually retired um, and they have to train them, uh, but it's only for one day. And there's a lot of uh, demand. Plus, while they're organizing the election and trying to figure out how to do the ballots, they're also, you know, maybe being flooded with voters who want to register, right? And this is another reason why stopping same day registration is a pain. We tried to get a bunch of students to register um, um, in our clerk's office when I was at university. And the woman just said, can you just bring everybody on the day of the election? Because otherwise what you, you need to do is you need to fill out the form. Then we have to hand enter it into the computer in time for it to be done. So it was actually for them, same day voter registration with uh, proper uh, credentials or whatever was so much easier because they filled out the form, you got to vote and then they could do it afterwards. So there's really a lot of, uh, and the states are supposed to help out or whatever, but you know, um, it's not like there's a federal grant that guarantees election people will always have the resources they need to put on a proper election. Yeah. It's just not something they value. I think, yeah, 2016, I think was just, I, from what I can imagine from like, you know, a little bit of distance now that what it did is it exposed a lot of strains and problems with the caucusing primary system in a lot of ways in both parties. Because, like, it did result in a lot of, basically, uh, I guess they just didn't anticipate people to take these things as seriously as they usually do. Because the whole, it's come a long way from, like, a few people in cigar-filled rooms in the 1960s just deciding. Yeah, I mean, there's always been, I mean, it's, you know, in terms of the good old days, it never was what it was. I mean, primaries have always been hard fought. People don't really remember, but, I mean, the Obama-Clinton fights of 2008 were pretty intense. 
I think the difference is that she, I'm going to just be honest, I think she rallied her, she played her part as a party person. She got behind the candidate, she did her bit, she supported him, and that's why you didn't see Clinton push back uh, against Obama uh, over the course of the remainder of the election like you did. And I certainly, as a Clinton supporter, didn't go around, well, you know, saying, oh, my candidate, you know, could be doing better against John McCain or whoever it was. But, um, uh, sorry, yes, so this, uh, the primary system, uh, they've, they've always been difficult and creaky and problematic. Uh, the, I think the difference is just more people, a new generation of people were paying attention this time. So you go back, you know, the Al Gore primary was pretty hard fought, the Clinton primary, um, with Jennifer Flowers and all that stuff, um, that was really hard fought. So, you know, it's just me because I'm older and I've lived through <laughs> more of them. Um, uh, you know, the fights, the difference is normally after the primary is won, there's more unity behind the candidate. And that didn't really happen for either candidate. This yeah. Time. So you don't think that's over sometime between 2008 and 2016 that Clinton just woke up or like, you know, Barack got woken up at about 3.01 a.m. from a phone call, and it was just Hillary on the other side saying, just checking, just checking. Yeah, 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 that, again, the 3 a.m. phone call. You know, and there's actually, I, I used it to kind of, ex I can't remember what for what reason. It was to, oh, I think it was to show uh, intertextuality, with the way that we use other cues in the culture to convey information. And if you don't know what that means, you won't understand what the person is trying to convey. And to illustrate this, I had a, um, a clip of Barack Obama and he was talking about, you know, oh, Hillary, you know, she's saying nasty things about me. And that's, you know, it's okay. That's what she's, you know, she's running her campaign, but you just gotta, you know, and then he just kind of, he does the rub, you know, dirt off your shoulders from the song and the crowd goes crazy and uh, the British kids didn't get it at all. So I didn't like to explain the hip hop uh, song, but I mean, that was very much a generational thing. If you knew what he was doing when he was rubbing, you know, or dusting the, the dirt off his shoulders, um, he was making that reference for his audience. And so, yeah, they were, they were pretty, the 3 a.m. call, the dirt off your shoulders, you know, it was, it was a pretty hard fall. I do remember that one actually. I, I, I was, partially paying attention for that one. I would think I was like 19 around then. So, but I do remember, um, I, I had hoped to, I was, I'm reading shattered and I was hoping to have had it done by the time we had this live stream, but then I got distracted. Um, do you plan on reading that or is that something that you're interested in? Uh, I don't know shattered. Which one's, what's that? So shattered is this, um, it's this new book. It came out, I think like, two weeks ago and it's about uh, it's basically a, a report of a whole bunch of stuff from people in the Clinton campaign and it was all people who talked to these two journalists on the record saying that they would never like don't publish our names and don't say anything until after the election and then they would talk and they got like a real big a really big discussion about like what how everything was from the inside and how there was like a lot of factionalism and stuff that was really um interesting i i haven't dug through it too much but um i thought it was an interesting piece of journalism i'm yeah i read the books after the 2012 campaign the political guys uh, mark halpern and john heilman did a book and then i think jonathan alter did a book i have to say i was really disappointed with all of them because as a as a political scientist and someone who loves elections it was more like the gossip of stuff rather than an analysis of like the polling and the news of the day and how the coverage. And I just felt, I mean, I understand that they want to turn these books around really fast and get them out, but it feels like they just do a diary on the road. And then after the diary, they just sort of sum up all of their notes and they put that into a book, which is, I guess for a journalist quite useful, but as a, as a political researcher, it's just too lightweight. I think you need more of the context and the polling on the day and the news events to really help people understand the campaign as an event over time. So, but that's yeah. just my preference. Uh, there'll be lots of people. There'll be plenty of dissertation on the 2016 election. I, I guarantee. <laughs> um, I imagine there's a lot of people just cutting it up from the inside because um, I think there were a lot of surprises that people are just like, how does that work? And how can we use that in the future? Yeah, well, don't forget that um, that uh, what was the fa the movie where what's her name played Sarah Palin? Game changer. 
Oh. Changer came right out of that kind of coverage of the McCain campaign. Um, yeah. And when uh, McCain and Palin ran. There's so, definitely going to be some more looking back at Sarah Palin. Yeah, that's... Let's not go back to Sarah Palin. <laughs> Let's keep Sarah Palin in the past where she belongs. She's yeah. fine there. She had her moment. She had her 15 minutes. Let's move on. <laughs> Yeah, she really tried. I just remembered, like, she really tried to capitalize on it. She, like, left her job and wrote a book. The book was awful. She got a Fox News job. Tried a network. Yeah, and I was just like, oh. She had some kind of pay-per-view network. Mm Mm-hmm. It was strange. And I also remember, like, then started stuff coming up, like, that her husband was, like, an Alaskan separatist. And, like, which, you know... All power to Alaska. Snowmobile. I remember that about him. Todd, wasn't it? Todd Palin. I don't know. Also, her kids all had weird names. Yes. Um, sorry, you're like uh, things are getting a little breaky uppy again. Park face and <laughs> yeah, a little. There's a dance in the force. It's all right. I think I think it's stabled out. Um, so uh, to change gears a little bit, um, I remembered a little while back a video, some videos you were making, and one of the ones that I remembered really well was that you were going to run this whole series on historical Jesus. You were like making this video from the airport as you were going to go home yes. and face your family for Christmas and everything. So, uh, what happened? Where'd it go? Uh, so what happened was uh, a lot of drama. <laughs> Gosh, I ended up uh, taking uh, some time to defend myself against false charges that were made against me. And um, yeah, so basically it was just a time issue. And it's on my to-do list. Like I was actually thinking about this today because I'm going to be on the road for a few weeks. I'm thinking, oh, well, I've got all the lectures written. And actually, if you go to that video, you can see everything I'm going to say because I've already written all like five lectures, like a uh, like lecture note format. Um, but it ended up just being uh, the urgent driving out up, and it was always the thing I could push off because it was like, oh, I've only done one, and it's going to take me like the thing I do want to come back to because it's a it's something that I'm quite uh, c- like passionate about because I want us as a community of people on YouTube to really make sure that our claims, especially in the atheist community, are based in evidence and the historical method and process exists for a reason. Um, it, it has a, just like the scientific method does, it has levels of rigor and it has levels of probability. Because you can't talk about in terms of history, it's always going to be some kind of interpretation. But I don't think it does any, it doesn't both just exist. Um, and making that assertion without really understanding the historians have come to the conclusion that the most did exist. And so what I wanted to do was really explain how the theory of a historical Jesus, you can link what historians almost universally, except for like the people who are making or writing books about a mythical Jesus, are saying is there's these certain particular set of, of circumstances and by if you, by looking at this, you can see how things changed over time. And what I see a lot in the, the non-historical Jesus side is a lot of back reading into or just basically it's, it's saying if I can undermine the historical Jesus evidence, then you must conclude that Jesus didn't exist, which to me sounds like a creationist saying, well, if I can just attack all of your evidence for evolution, then you have to accept that God created the universe. And I don't find any of those arguments plausible. So because I mean, Professor Bart Ehrman, and there's also Dale Martin, who has some videos um, from Yale on YouTube, which are well worth watching. When you listen to historians talk about it, it it is it is based in that kind of evidence. And more importantly, it all makes sense. Whereas with the mythical Jesus people, there are a lot of competing ideas, and I don't see them offering a coherent theory that conforms to the observable facts. Because so, yeah, this is actually something I was planning on uh, maybe tackling in the future, but if you're going to go after it, I'm, I'm going to leave that one up to you. Well, maybe we uh, can collab. Maybe we ooh, can collab and we'll get out together. That'd be fun. Um, I mean, I'm 
basically living in another dimension until the until July. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that that'd be fun. Um, and also, I'm just thinking about like what an outsider would say about with like, I planned on doing this series that was really academic, but then all right, there's this cartoon bear that said that I did this thing. It's like okay, um, and I got kind of busy with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, you see, he's like this Australian cartoon bear. Um, that hates women or something. It's like, okay, let's, um, <laughs> yeah. But the basic premise, like I said, you know, if it's not just about the person of Jesus, you can't yeah. just go, okay, if we take away these little bits of things and then we make Jesus go away. You have to be able to account for the theological development over time. And this is one of the things I kind of point to in the video is that there's the relationship between what is the nature of, of Jesus that, that you can see actually becoming more complicated and diversifying over time. The notions of what God's relationship to Jesus is. There's the notion of um, just the text themselves. You know, Mark is a Mark is my favorite gospel, which is kind of a weird thing to say as an atheist. But Mark has got a, a simplicity. It's not perfectly written. It's not very well written. But there is an elegance to its parsimony. The fact that it starts with his baptism. You know, the people who read the Bible and atheists know this, that Mark doesn't start with a nativity. nativity. It starts with the, um, the baptism of Jesus, and that's an adoptionist theology, the idea that Jesus was a human who was adopted by God to be the Son of God. And that's different from what we see writers later um, Matthew, the authors of Matthew and Luke, who after people weren't happy with just a, a baptismal story, so they had to go back to the nativity. And then you see the people in, in the Johnian community who are like, well, he must have always been God. So then they come up with this idea of the logos, right? So that progression over time makes sense if Jesus started out as a person who, who really lived and then people later came to think of as a son of God. And they pointed first to his baptism and then they pointed to his birth and then they pointed to him actually being co-eternal with the father. Now, if it was a myth from the beginning, why would it change? If Jesus didn't exist and he was some sort of being that was, well, I don't even know what the mythicists think in terms of the theology of Jesus, of the early so-called so, so mythical Jesus. But I see how it makes complete sense based on things like Buddha and Elvis. <laughs> you know, first it's a dude and then people think he's amazing and then people start seeing him after he's dead or they consider him this, this a magnificent thing. And if, if, if it was... Um, if it was that he never existed, then this answer some questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Who were the first people to come up with it? And don't just tell me the gospel writers, right? Because they had to precede it. So if, 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 if it was it John the Baptist, or do we throw John the Baptist out as ahistorical as well? Or was it some other figure? Well, do you have evidence for that figure? So who was it? Uh, where did this happen? You know, because you saw, um, you can see from the way that the patterns of the stories go and, and the locations of where modern scholars think these stories emerged from, the spread of Christianity through the ancient uh, Middle East. And then, you know, what precisely was the first ideas about what, 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 were, what was the mythical Jesus? We see in Q, a sayings gospel, if you accept Q, which I do, because you can infer Q from both Matthew and Luke if you subtract Mark. Um, I hope I'm not losing your audience because <laughs> this is a really specialist discussion, but I hope everyone's keeping up with me. Uh, so, you know, what was the first Jesus myth and where can we find it? Um, you know, where was it written? Why was it? Why would people just make up somebody who didn't exist? And you can say, yeah, there were these group of Jews who had mystic beliefs, but unless you have a name and a date and a location, I don't see a reason to believe you. Um, and how did the message spread? How were they able to convince people of a person who didn't exist? Because some people just seem to slide into this idea that he didn't exist, but very quickly people mistook it and thought that he did exist. Um, so is that the case or did they know they were worshiping a myth and how do you know that they know that they were worshiping a myth? Uh, there's a lot of questions I have that mythicists just don't seem to have good answers for. Whereas the historical Jesus thesis, if you want to put it, or theory, does not only make sense, it also um, maps onto other like you know, the sightings of Elvis. Elvis is still alive. Uh, and it also, we can put it to the data and the data still makes sense. So the observable data are the data we have, especially as historians. You can't throw away data. You can't just throw away Matthew or Mark or throw away this piece or that piece because it's all you have. You have to make it, the theory has to fit the data. The data does not fit the theory. So I'm just going to get off my soapbox now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you know, you're hitting on a lot of stuff that has to do with um, 
with yeah with how historians work and such because like um one of the things that comes up fairly often as historians uh more people who do older stuff than the stuff i do is that um there's different types of data collection methods like you know there's random sampling and um there's one with historians which is you take anything because there's so little left that you have to deal with it and like there are historians who study a period of about a century long where they have half or maybe a quarter of a piece of paper as the entirety of the evidence they have for this period and they've done a lot with it mm -hmm. and so you can't yeah when it comes to something that happened you know you know i think it's between 1900 and 2000 years ago there's a lot of like we overestimate how much we know about that period and how much we know about what's going on. And you can't just like dismiss uh, text, contemporary text, even if it is a hundred years old, given that this is stuff that happened thousands of years ago is super useful. Yeah, exactly. You, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater and then go, Oh, well, I guess we just have to conclude he didn't exist. You know, that's, that's not how rigorous academic research goes. Yeah. And I, I tip my caps to historians because there's so much less. And what you do have, you know, you there's also, the, you know, you have to be aware that the authors have bias and you have bias, and not bias, but your perspective coming to the text that you don't understand the worldview of the authors are trying to recreate as accurately as possible the understanding the author would have had at the time and why he, because generally it was only men who were literate and educated and only a small proportion at that, um, you know, would have thought, would, would he have understood or this community have understood by like a word like logos, which is a Greek word um, being put into the mouth of an illiterate Aramaic peasant from the Galilee. Um, you know, so it gets, yeah. uh, it, it stops being about, you know, in that case, about the historical Jesus for the Jonian community and becomes about uh, what Jesus represents to them, you know, what he's become to them. So I imagine it comes from a place of like, because I've been there, everyone's, you know, when they first became an atheist, became like a firebrand person who thinks that, you know, if you disprove Jesus's existence, somehow there won't be Christians anymore. And it's like, right. Uh, at some point, you have to realize that religion, I mean, a lot of atheists realize this, religion's not exactly about facts, but it's also not about nothing. And there's yeah. there's there's stuff going on, and there's stuff that's important and inspirational and valuable to people. And if it all turned out to be fake, I don't think it would deter them. Like, I, don't, I think there's a lot of Mormons out there who realize that, you know, they don't scratch too deep on their religion, but they also think that their religion has a lot to say about uh, how strong their family is and their identity and nationality and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can you can you can show that the the founder of Mormonism was a con man. It doesn't seem to have you know put a damper on Mormonism as a as a religion. <laughs> They're still going strong. I think I, I, as, I, a lot of this is coming from the conversation that the the videos you've been posting all week because you've we were almost like mirroring some of these talk points, but. Um, I actually was wanted to talk about the the atheism thing because I was like, oh, uh, you were talking about the hard agnostics and like level six agnostics, and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. geez, okay. So I put myself in the realm of uh, the title of apatheist, which is that I don't care whether or not God exists, and if he does, I don't feel any obligation to do anything for him, but also. I'm starting to, my number is starting to go down on my agnosticism because, not because I'm starting to believe in the supernatural or anything like that, but I'm, if, if, if to me, if a God exists, it's probably a grad student and we're a computer simulation. And I actually, <laughs> that's actually becoming less and less unlikely, which is crazy. It does feel like, yes, like, I feel like I've gotten off on the wrong, on the parallel reality where Donald Trump is president. Like, how did I end up in this, this time stream? <laughs> where did this, this, surely this is, a, there's an experiment where the, and there's a control group somewhere else with like a Clinton presidency and they're going to see how things go. But um, yeah, for me, the issue of knowledge of a supernatural being, first, it's just like, I don't understand what most people mean by God. And that doesn't mean like I don't understand that people have a concept of God. I just think the concept they have is completely incomprehensible. 
and and they hold a lot of contradictory opinions about it in thing in ways that it couldn't exist. For instance, the idea that God is somehow perfect and unchanging, but also uh, became a human being and died and then went back up to uh, like flew back in the sky and like how does God change if not change if he becomes a human and so it seems more of the issue of the possibility of the being they describe existing is far is is impossible <laughs> not that gods could exist yeah i mean but i also don't fault them for it i'm sure i believe things that are unrealistic and crazy too it's just that i don't uh i don't dictate policy based on it, I guess. And this is the real issue, right? I mean, I think it's more about when people want to, you to follow their religion. That's where that's where the lines are. If everyone's religion was a private thing, we didn't have theocracies, we didn't have people trying to legislate their morality, um, then what? Who would, who cares what you think? But it's when your beliefs start to inform the power of the state and how the state treats other citizens. That's actually, the, I think, the real problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel like that's just like, because like I was around during like atheism day, like the YouTube atheism days of your like 2007 and eight and such. And I remembered what it was like. And I remembered being into that stuff mostly because I was like 18, 19 years old. And that's how you are when you're 18 or 19 years old. But now, you know, now I'm going to be 30 next year. And it's just like, all right, you know. I got. I. I can't do that. I can't be as much of a, of a zealot. I don't know how. Like, I can't imagine what kind of weird psychological places people like Richard Dawkins are, who are like pushing. I think he's in his sixties or seventies. Yeah, yeah. Probably in the seventies, and yet still is like. You know the edge lord atheist from who are mostly like eighteen, nineteen years old. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, it's um, Dawkins certainly holds a special place in a lot of atheist communities. I was actually at a, a conference in Switzerland that is looking at non-belief and unbelief. And there was a lot of um, qualitative research because you just don't have enough atheists in most countries to do a proper survey. And also because there's such small portions of the population relative to other groups, it's even sampling them isn't representative because they're just you know they're they're their own kind of group of people and one thing that did come up was you know there were uh, like an asian group in malaysia and asian and atheist groups in in other parts of the world and one of the common features is you know they all they all had dawkins on the shelf in their their atheist meeting groups or places and his contribution to sort of waking a lot of people up whether or not they go on to agree with what he posts on twitter or even know what he posts on twitter but certainly the even just reading a book like hitchens reading a book like dawkins that takes on religion i don't think the god delusion is that great a book personally but um just having that for the first time feels edgy and liberating um, and that's why when I first, I mean, I didn't really become officially an atheist until my late, my or, well, early 30s, but I didn't kind of realize that I was like a closeted atheist until my mid 30s. And that's when I found YouTube and started to get to self-educate, you know, the Kalam argument and all of these kinds of things. And yeah, there's a lot of, there were a lot of channels. You know, Armored Skeptic was a channel I was subscribed to, Logic. A Thunderfoot, I watched the whole series, Why People Laugh at Creationists, and they were ideas I had never been exposed to, and they were really exciting. But then at some point, you just kind of get on with your life, you know? Yeah, I remember because I was like, I think just the right age and just like the right type of person at that period, because I remembered liking Thunderfoot and The Amazing Atheist and all those things. And I remembered like, oh man, if I had stuck with this and just gone a few dark turns, I could have been a horrible human being. But um I remembered all that stuff happening and uh, I remember breaking with them and I, what's it called? I remember when I broke with them and the exact moment and everything and it was all about elevators and Rebecca Watson and everything. But I was yeah. there for all of that. Yeah, I, that was before my time. For me, my heartbreak of a, like, like you've crossed the line with me and I need to walk away from, from this was uh, when the Bible Reloaded talked about having Milo on. And I just went, you know, you guys can do your show, but I can't be your patron anymore because that guy is just like beyond the pale. And this was about a year and a half before his pedophile or not pedophile, I should correct myself, his comments about having sex with underage kids 
were hit the big time. But you know, that was something that within like the feminist YouTube community, people had done videos on it, you know, Kevin Logan and SJW 101. And so, yeah, I mean, I knew he was a total scumbag. I'm like, how could you even sit down with a guy who would do these kinds of things? Um, but yeah, that was sad. I mean, I, I wish Jake and Hugo all the best. I just couldn't give them any more of my money after that. So. Yeah, I, I walked away after all fallout with like when they had the first when they had those skeptic conventions and they turned into complete shit shows and when uh treating Rebecca Watson like a person apparently was too tall in order I just walked away and I was just like all right I'm done with like skepticism and being like you know having atheism as a core part of my identity or anything like that and I still am not too into that stuff but then I came back uh mostly because of the stuff that you and Kevin are doing and I was just like, holy shit, this moment, this movement has gone nuts. Like, I don't remember Thunderfoot talking anything about social issues. And then I come back and that's literally all he is now. And I was just like, what happened? What happened to all these people? Why did they start going crazy? Yeah, and the thing that was depressing to me is, you know, I still do it when I can from time to time, but there is a really important nexus between atheism and feminism. There is a, there, and, and it's not just about beating up on uh, Islam. Okay, it's got to be a broader critique than that. Um, but there are really interesting points to be made about how women are presented in the Bible and what kind of, um, what kind of messages that sends boys and girls and men and women and where are we getting our values from if not from the bible right if we say we're okay we're, we're atheists and we reject all that supernatural stuff well all that patriarchy and stuff came along with it are we really self-reflecting on those kind of gender roles um and over time you know like the, it just, there's, there's a whole lot of things that we could actually use to like um the the woman on the most recent episode of Feminist Talk Back where we talked about the the Mormon blogger who was challenging other white women to have a match or beat her six babies in order to prevent like the white genocide. And I was just like, you know, you're just treating women like breeding machines. This whole idea yeah. of, you know, we need to have more and there are there's good conversations to be had there if we weren't just kind of unfortunately having to deal with really pointless conversations yeah. that end up taking up a lot of time i have two points to that one does that mormon mom blogger have like an address that you can like mail gifts to if so <laughs> somebody is getting a paperback version of the handmaid's tale uh second <laughs> of all condoms. yeah uh second of all yeah i i mean there's a lot of really cool stuff to pick apart when it comes to supernatural beliefs and and patriarchy and feminism but then, yeah, you can't get to that. You can't get to 102 because every time you have that discussion, you'll get a 28-minute 20 vid 20 video response from the skeptical sharpener or something. And <laughs> um, yeah, I'm dealing with like one point that I made or, you know, chomping it up or someone else. Yeah, so I think, you know, it does seem to me that there's a, there's a lot of stuff happening on the right, the political right um, in the YouTube atheist community. And it's, it's with Trump being in power and, you know, with May and uh, hopefully not Le Pen in France, hopefully not Le Pen, but it's, it's harder to just be oppositional when it's your people in power. And I'm starting to see more fragmentation there. I'm hoping that's going to kind of create some space, to be honest, for people who do want to explore these kinds of issues to, to deal with it a bit more. But it, yeah, I mean, I totally, I think there's, some, I agree. I think there's some fascinating nexus, and especially as you say, with spirituality and the role of um, uh, gender roles in Western Europe and how those have been formed over time as a result of being Christian. Whereas if we had been, you know, in, in a more pagan situation, you know, what would been the, how might that have been different? So, and yeah, that's the pagans of masculinity. Are, Christianity's got nothing on like the Roman Empire. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's true. And then, you know, you can bring in the whole idea of, of Nietzsche and the slave morality, you know, um, the powerful, what is good for society? Is it a, is it uh, values that go to power and, and construction or, and, you know, domination, or is it being meek and submissive and, um, and being a slave and living for the next life? And, um, and yeah, this, so there's some really good conversations we could be having. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm glad that you do that sometimes. I, I, I that's why I like. I, I mean, I follow a, a bunch of you guys on 
on it. And I, I, I think uh, Will's told you once in a while that like, I'm the person who's like listening to the three hour live stream. Recording. You're the one. <laughs> uh, just sitting there, you know, just handing you fistfuls of watch time while I like, I'm working on something because I, so cause like there's a handful of people that I'm, I'm I, I, got, I think I started with Kevin and then I kind of spiraled out from him. I like Kevin because he's basically like the leftist id of the YouTube community, you know? Yeah. He's just like, I'm pissed off. I want to hear someone get pissed off for me. And that's him. And, you know, you have, you have the talk show. Mm -hmm. um, and then I tried getting into, oh, uh, gosh, what's his name? He's the, the big one, the famousest one, the one who vlogs uh -huh. every single day. Oh, Steve Shives. Yeah. I, I liked him for a while, then I just kind of fell out of love. I don't know. No, I have nothing against him. I didn't do anything yeah. weird. It just a There are bit things by like Steve I watch all the time, and the things I, I don't even pay. Like his wrestling show, I've, I don't think I've ever sat through an entire episode of his wrestling uh, things. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Yeah, and then um, the one I'm liking very much lately, and I know that you and him had a bit of a back and forth lately. He got a little grumpy. Um, it's a New Zealander. He's a Kiwi guy. Um, Tim. Tim. Yes, Tim Blake. You know, on that, I will actually do a special announcement for your viewers and your viewers only. Tomorrow oh, morning, my time, Tim and I are going to have a hangout and talk about Bernie Sanders and the future of the Democratic Party. Damn, I got to so watch that. Watch for that. As, yeah. as someone who was, I think 2016 made us all a little crazy uh, in one way or another. I think. Every, yes. <laughs> I think everyone, everybody, including all of those, you know, Edge lords on YouTube, all of the skeptical squirrels out there are going to ten years from now probably think that, yeah, twenty sixteen not our best moment for anybody. Yeah, there was uh, a lot. There's a lot of frustration. There was a lot of frustration. I think in twenty sixteen, a lot of um, anger on. Uh, yeah, plenty of anger to go around. Basically, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be a fair assessment. Yeah, but and, we're gonna hopefully um, talk about. Hope that Tim so, and you he, have a good time. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically going to tell him, going to try to get him to convince me why, like, Bernie Sanders is a solution, the Democratic, but he's not the candidate the party needs, but he's, no, he's not the candidate the party wants, but he's the candidate they need. Is that the Batman line? I think I'm trying so, yeah. to make Bernie, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was also actually kind of drifted into how it should have ended superheroes or super friends cafe Batman rather than the Christian Bale Batman, but, um, because I'm Batman. Oh man, yeah, it's. But other good recommendations, uh, Sean and Jen. Really oh yeah, good stuff. I love Sean and Jen's channel, and of course H Bomber guys another really good one. And ContraPoints, yes. I'm actually a patron of. Oh nice. I don't know. Um, and how... uh, uh, Garrett, he's been kind of quiet, but Garrett does great stuff too. Yeah, that uh, when you I, I think I watched uh, that was one of the longer live streams I watched was the one you did with him because. Uh, I remembered that one of the things I wanted to make sure that the stream didn't have it. I was like, I'm sure she's sick of dealing with another anarcho syndicalist or whatever. So I was like, all right, I'm not going to get that path because you're like the sole liberal in like, in some ways, a sea of, of yeah. libertarian <laughs> socialists. And so yeah, it's like I the mean, one echo chair we have. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, I think my politics adapt slightly to the country. So I think there's only so much you can do within the system in America and that, so my goals for American politics are much more modest than let's say, um, I would be, I'm gonna, you know, what I would like to see for Britain is to people not have zero hour contracts. What I would like to see for Britain is where students don't have to get the kind of debt that Americans have to endure in order to get an opportunity to compete for a job. I would like to see a Britain where people who are disabled aren't made to take tests to prove they have a disability um, in a massive government contract that actually could have been much better spent. I mean, there's, there's so, you know, the kind of politics that I would, you know, like favor also really depend on, on the country. So my, I can't see America realistically having the kinds of policies that you get in some social democratic countries in Europe because they're just not there yet. Like the, the system is is built to prevent that kind of thing. So I'm a much more of a gradualist and a pragmatist in a very American philosophical tradition of pragmatism um, and, on, on American politics. But I think I'm far more left wing on, on, on European politics because I can be. Yeah, actually, um, 
that, that, that brings up something interesting because if you notice that all of the biggest, at least YouTuber Sanders supporters are like from New Zealand and Europe and, and Canada because it's like... Uh, you can be. You can be a Bernie like, supporter from Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, Sanders feels like a, a typical like NDP leader here. Mm -hmm. But I guess I don't know what it's like to live in such a right-wing country. I don't know the feeling. Yeah, and how restricted um, and how purple, you know, especially with the winner take all. If it was the case that, you know, like the Tea Party was its own party and the Republicans were their own party and they were going into coalition, you know, then you could have a Green Party and a Democratic Party uh, or a Green Tea Party and a Democratic Party trying to, to work together but also being different right but in in american politics everyone's got to fit in the same big tent and if you start to pull the tent you know farther and farther in one direction whether that's left or right you end up it's like a big bed cover you're going to pull covers off of some other people so yeah i think it's it's kind of just a, a bit of the animal that is the political system in america and then you know there's a whole issue of money and politics and oh god yeah so um, that's another problem that most countries just don't face is the the trying to to deal with the amount of money it takes to run an election it's not even just the amount of money in in politics it's the fact that money is needed in order to win and so po politicians are always junkies for money um so it's, it's a kind of a chicken and the egg problem you know in terms of that yeah i think there's been three three elections in the last century in the united states that weren't won by the highest uh monetized leader like i think that it's um it's trump it's mckinley and i think there's one <laughs> other one all the way back to mckinley yeah that's okay yeah that yeah, makes it's, sense. Yeah. it's three since 1877 anyway because 1877 is considered like when american electoral politics changed forever but okay. um because that was the election where basically uh america the, the nice way to say it is that's when America officially got over civil war politics, but it's actually when the Republicans and Democrats made a deal to basically give up on civil rights in the South until the 1960s. Yeah, the real. Um, it's when the Republicans basically. Yeah, this is that was when um, when Hayes lost the popular vote, but won the electoral college or it was he won it but it was not a majority and so the republicans and democrats made a deal to give hayes the presidency if republicans would stop doing stuff in the south right trying to fix the south yeah, yeah. so it was Back like the end of reconstruction and everything yeah and you know it is funny because you know that was the democrats then and, and the republicans were the northerners who were for abolition and all that stuff and, and it's similar to me in the way that back um until like in the last eh, 100 or so 150 years i don't know exactly but baby blue was associated with girls because the virgin mary in western christianity was always had baby blue on and boys were considered uh pink was considered a male color because pink was like a lighter version of red and red was a powerful masculine color and then they flipped and you know and i see that with the democrats and the republicans too but you still have republicans going do you know who um founded like the civil rights this is in the it was who who charged it was republicans back in the 1860s they're still trying to ride the coattails of that shit so <laughs> yeah i mean it was i mean it was the republicans finest hour so i guess they they've been riding on it ever since yeah they basically like the one time they weren't it was the democrats who were in the south and doing all that bad stuff and we we were kind of a you know opposed to it um but yeah anyway despite that like yeah you know, all the really old republican politicians right now were democrats in their youth and crossed the aisle in the 60s and stuff yeah and then you look at yeah the party it's like the the magnets and the polls you know switching you know that happened but yeah yeah, yeah you, you can go through that whole thing i i know exactly what what those elections were like is 1912 and 1968 and uh yeah. i'm pretty much go back to the two big ones. yeah you i will defer to your presidential history historical knowledge in this in this instance certainly because um basically for me it like starts with jimmy carter well nixon technically when i was born was about to get kicked out of office but really carter was the president and the iranian crisis so actually the before reagan getting shot i remember the iranian hostage crisis Oh, okay. I, I remembered I was born in November, and so 
all the newspapers were talking about uh, the new president, George Bush, getting elected. So that's per like right in that spot. Like I was born in uh, Reagan's yeah. lame duck period. But um, yeah, 1912 was the election where Woodrow Wilson got elected. And that was the election where the progressives, like the left wing Republicans all left on a third party run by, um, by Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, the Bull, the Bull Moose Party. Yeah. yeah, and so after that, all of like the the progressive uh, Northerners and liberals left the Republicans and became Democrats because Wilson was uh, more of a progressive. And then 1968 was when the Southern strategy took hold, and that's when all the former, all of the racist Democratic states, like the the, the Southern Southern white racists swapped into the Republican Party. And those are like the two things yeah. that really are the And then the North and White Racist just moved thing. into the suburbs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, of course with the whole liberal conservative divide being mostly based on rural urban and rural yeah. mentalities or class. And so uh America's I don't you guys don't this this another weird America thing is that you guys don't redistrict with new seats because of something FDR did. And oh, we so, do. Okay, I know we, we redistricting happens after every census, usually two years after the census, based on population shifts and how many seats get moved around. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. No, I mean like uh, I think after FDR, like most countries add new seats when oh. population increases. But I think like every election, if you think about it, every se- every House member, every Congress person is representing more and more people every election because you guys yes. don't add new seats. Right. You know, it makes sense because we had eventually it was 50 seats. Right. So we had mm-hmm. to st- once we had the 50th state, which I think actually we should have Puerto Rico and I think D.C. should be its own um, independent Organi- it shouldn't be managed um, managed by DC, but yeah, that five thirty five uh, number for the four thirty five plus a hundred in the Senate, yeah, they just keep moving it around, and but the numbers don't get um, the numbers of representatives because the numbers of senators are fixed; it's always two per state, but the number of representatives don't change. Yeah, yeah, that's why you have a state like Wyoming that has three, represent, but actually has a population density so low that it wouldn't qualify for statehood if it applied again. <laughs> right, yes. And that also is, um, and you know, again, we get back to the redistricting and the, the fairness and the politics and the way things are, are, are the way that the, the structure shapes the outcomes of government. And that, that also is part of it. Because that, so- obviously people get a lot more representation than people in other states. Yeah, that's why, like, if you want to vote, if you want to have your voice said in America, live in, like, Montana. Yes. Because, like, one vote in Montana is probably worth like, I would probably say almost a hundred New Yorker votes. Oh yeah, easily. Cause you know, you probably at some point, you know, cause not everybody votes and American turnout is terrible. It's if you were lucky at 60%, right? So that half the population, you don't even have to bother with. And the rest of the population, you know, you probably know a lot of those people. <laughs> you know, there's only so many people in the state, right? So if you live there for 40 or 50 years and you're in politics, you're going to know the county chair of this person and then his wife or her wife or her husband, and their kids, and this person went to school with that person. And yeah, like in a place like, you know, Wyoming, you know, you could, it's all six degrees of everybody else. So. so there's the trick. I know how to save America. I know how to make America a progressive country. What we need to do is we need to embrace some of the most annoying parts of the left-wing lifestyle, which is we need to get way more organic farmers and like like people who just want to move to the country because they just want to, you know, be one with the earth, mother. And like you need to get those people and just start moving to like Wyoming and Montana and Kansas and just start – like just start these like hippie farms and then eventually you'll, you'll win. I have, I didn't like the, didn't the Russian, the communist intelligentsia try this early on after the Romanov demise where they had all of these people who went out into the, to speak to the farmers of Russia and tried to like educate them into 
uh, class consciousness and help them and it all went terribly wrong and didn't work out very well at all but it would be different this time because we're not communists and it's also people can actually sustain themselves but yeah go, get out into those rural areas you know just um about maybe you know 75,000 new yorkers just happen to move to the, the same state <laughs> and start then, an organic wind farm or you know they can move there for like um whatever the voting residency length is so in wisconsin you have to sleep three nights i think it was again this was they might have changed the law but three nights at a resident to be like living there if you move into a house you have to sleep there three nights before that's your address um, so yeah, just have mass migrations and then register to vote, and we'll balance that out. We'll like spread out that representation so it's a little more equi equitably distributed. Joking, yeah, we have to like we have to find a way to get like high speed internet out to those areas and um, quinoa. They like quinoa. Start like send quinoa that way. Kale. And kale. <laughs> just be like, just like start a rumor. Be like, you know, Montana has like the best kale in America. Yeah, and just mass yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I wonder if that would even be wrong. I bet. I bet, I bet. Weed. That would probably help get a lot of yeah. left wing people. If you want to bring a lot of left wing people and just legalize, decriminalize it in your state, thank you. That's happening here. It's going to be. It's a whole thing. How is it coming? Uh, get we're supposed to... What is the state in Canada? Yeah, so, What's the... yeah. so it's currently. No, I think it's it's decriminalized in small amounts. It, Canada's really decentralized, so each province has its own thing. But like the Trudeau government announced, I think a couple months ago, that it is legalizing marijuana for Canada Day of 2018. So July 1st, 2018. And that'll be the second country on earth to do it after Uruguay. Because um, right. you know you know Trudeau was token. You got to know he yeah, was a dog. <laughs> He's like, he knows but, it's yeah. not a it's not the social problem that alcohol is. He knows these things. He knows how to get Vice on his side, and Vice is a big media organization in Canada. So, um, so it's going to be legal by 2018. And basically, uh, he's got the former police chief of Toronto as like the head of the task force to do this. We had our every year. We have some law where you can actually selectively break the law if you're protesting that law's existence. And so every 420, Toronto has this huge marijuana uh, protest thing, and it was a huge celebration this year. Uh, right now, the marijuana advocates are pushing for not arresting anybody until the law takes a place, mm -hmm. because right now you can still get arrested for possessing marijuana, something that will be legal a year from now, which is a little yeah. silly. And basically, they're they're working out how they're going to. Uh, how they're going to get it to work. Because right now it's very much like on the California model, like you go to dispensaries, you give them your your um, your card and then you get it because, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't know if it's OHIP funded, but it's like health, you know, it's subsidized in some fashion. But like when it's legalized recreationally, like, um, I don't know, you're, you live in Germany? Yeah, so I've been to Amsterdam. A few times. Okay, so uh, I don't know how, how how does liquor work in Germany? Is it like I'm in Canada or at least in Ontario, you can't buy booze in places like grocery stores and stuff. I imagine Germany is way more cool about this kind of stuff. Yeah, so you can buy beer and wine at sixteen and hard alcohol at eighteen. And um, basically, I, I don't think that there's. I'm trying to think if there's a time limit on it. And you know, I've been out to a carnival, and you you know, you wander into a kiosk and you grab a nice German beer out of the fridge and it costs you about a euro 50 or less and then you they have um bottle openers at the register so once you've paid for it you can just pop the top and throw your cap away and then walk out drinking it i i don't think that there's a time like uh, so yeah i know what you mean like dry states and times and certain stores can't sell it after nine o'clock and all that kind of stuff i've never had a problem buying booze in germany <laughs> guess i'll put it that way i imagine that because germany is a beautiful place uh, the way that it works here is i like I said, every province has its own thing. So we actually have, it's 19 in almost all provinces except for Alberta and Quebec where it's 18. And most of those places, because for some reason we decided to use our sin taxes to pay for the healthcare system. So alcohol and cigarettes are very expensive here compared to other countries. And you can only buy liquor from, for the longest time here in Ontario, it was basically any place you bought liquor outside of a bar, you could only buy from government stores. 
But now you can buy uh, wine and beer in some grocery stores. They have some deals with some grocery stores. But uh, yeah. And so that's pretty strict. Yeah. That's very strict. Yeah. And uh, oh, yeah, we have some other really crazy ones too. Like uh, in Ontario, even if you have your full class license, so we have graduated licensing, we have three levels of licenses. So if you have your full license, if you're under 21, you basically have the learner's permit level of alcohol tolerance. So if you're 20 and you have a full driver's license, like, you know, you did all the things, you did everything right, and you get pulled over and you breathe in the legal limits, but it's above zero. Like, you have to have the alcohol level of, like, an airline pilot in order to not get uh, in trouble. Yeah, that's it's also, crazy. there's, yeah, and well, can I ask a question? If you do have, uh, if you get pulled over for driving under the influence, um, do you lose your license automatically or do you also get like a, some kind of occupational permit to keep you going back and forth from work every day? I don't know. I think we have some sort of demerit point system where like you can actually get like points taken off of your license and if you get so many, they take it away. I think it might be different. It, it, the severity of it depends upon how much you blow over and mm -hmm. whether or not you destroy something. Like, right. uh, but but there's also like uh, it's a straight it's different in different places because there's a whole joke in this country about how you know in Ontario if you uh, drink and fall asleep at the wheel you'll crash and die, but if you drink and fall asleep at the wheel in Saskatchewan you'll wake up the next morning and you'll be out of gas, <laughs> and so um, I think it there's yeah. a lot of yeah Canada's a really weird country on that sense but. Um, so they're trying to figure out how marijuana is going to be legalized and what it's going to mean. And Ontario, as you can probably tell, seems to write its laws like it's an actuary rather than like an actual like legal system. Right. And so, because they're like, they'll, they can justify a law saying, well, it's going to reduce alcohol-related fatalities by like 2.3% and therefore we should pass it. It's like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever it takes, you know, if that yes, makes so, it happy. So it's pushed with a mandate. There's two mandates. One, they are, are heavily developing a marijuana breathalyzer test so that okay. you can get a DUI for, uh, for driving while high. Yeah, fair enough. And they're also working really heavily on, uh, they have a bunch of like these random laws that I, I assume are just in place to make old people feel less scared. So it's like, you can't have, you can grow your own marijuana, but you can't have more than four plants and they can't be over one meter tall. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> your marijuana plant cannot be taller than this in order to stay on this ride. <laughs> yeah. And so like, I'm just imagining the police walking around with meter sticks, just being like, <laughs> that plant, like, Trim that. that plant is too tall. Um, and then marijuana is going to probably be like one of the major features is we're probably going to tax it because I think mm -hmm. projected marijuana taxes are the reason why Ontario passed its first balanced budget in like an age and a half. They they yep. passed they passed a balanced budget for the first time since like 1996 and it includes a pilot program for universal basic income and a complete subsidy for um for medication for kids under 24. That's amazing. That's so great. That's, uh, that's Kathleen Wynne trying, trying to win the election. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's just about redistributing the resources in a way to, you know, have a, have a particular impact. And you can take those resources and hand them over to corporations and go, hey, here's some more money. Hope you create some jobs with this. Or you can do things that are actually going to, like, a basic in universal income. Then people can actually buy things. You're increasing demand, not just supply. But, yeah, they're doing yeah. a pilot program in two rural towns, like two small cities and one big city. And uh, it's, I think it started this month. I think the people got their first checks this month. And so uh, we'll be seeing, we're checking it out. But yeah, I do like that. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of very forward thinking stuff coming out of the liberals in the last, the Ontario liberals, because also in Canada, our political parties at the provincial level are technically separate from those at the federal level. And so you have the Ontario Liberal Party, which in no way is associated with the federal Liberal right. Party, and they have their own thing, and they do. And, and so, the Progressive Conservative Party that I said that uh, got absorbed into the Canadian Alliance and became the Conservative Party of Canada 
does it doesn't exist at the federal level, but we have a progressive conservative party of Ontario. So right. it's it's all really weird. Um, but in some way, that's good because you can then have the provinces as laboratories and they try these different policies and the ones that work, the party up, if it works at the, you know, the Ontario level, um, they're going to, they're going to try it out at the federal level, but um, they'll, you know, could distance themselves a little bit if it doesn't go well. So, yeah. And we're getting into a situation where we need to start thinking of new strategies because Canada is a country that is almost entirely economically dependent on resource extraction, primary extraction, lumberjacks and miners and farmers. Mm -hmm. And and now that oil is no longer a thing that we can rely on, we yeah. need to find other options. And so one of, the, one of the ideas was to turn Ontario into a new Silicon Valley. And I think this basic income is part of that to encourage new things to happen. Right, with that whole sort of the nexus. Was it Freakonomics? I can't remember. The book about like the cosmopolitan and the kind of the, the cities that thrive tended to have these, you know, they're tolerant, they're culturally diverse. There's, you know, these kinds of other things available cult, um, in the, in, not just in business, but also the quality of life. And yeah, I mean, unless your new cash crop is going to be green um, <laughs> and sending it over to California, some really finely grown Canadian stuff on mass market. Um, yeah, you, you, there's only so many trees. There's only so much mining that you can do. Farming, we, you know, if you take care of the earth, it should be all right. But um, yeah, I think building the creation, you want to get into an economy of the 21st century and be in the leading edge of that. So yeah, seems like a sensible way to go. And also, like, I mean, you uh, with our resource extraction, like, uh, I don't know if this is like this is like the hugest news in Canada, but um, Trump threw a thirty percent tariff on softwood lumber exports from Canada, and this was huge news. But that means that like because we're so economically dependent on trade in the United States, that if say a president comes to power who has extremely protectionist economic policies, we can be very much to the whims because it's kind of hard to send wood to like China. We were trying um, it, but it's not as easy. I um I get the feeling from Trump, you know, he tried it on in Syria and Putin sort of stepped up behind Assad going, don't try that again. Try to, you know, he wants to sort of um, antagonize things with North Korea, but the Chinese are going to keep him in check. And like a bully who's just gotten turned away or beaten twice, you just go to Canada and like shove the Canadians because he can. And I just, oh, I like hate that man so much. <laughs> like I don't. Yeah. You know, and he does it out of this protectionist, oh, we're going to, you know, the, and he, oh, this is what also made me mad about it, because he, he wanted to pretend like he's hiding behind Wisconsin dairy farmers. You know what? There are no more dairy farmers in Wisconsin. They have all been bought, bought out by corporations, because California is the biggest dairy producer in the United States now. It's not been Wisconsin for a long time. So this idea of, like, idyllic little farmhouses dotting the landscape of the green, rolling landscape of Wisconsin, these poor independent farmers... There's, they're increasingly, they're being driven out by American corporations, not Canadian ones. Yeah. And it's been and, going uh, on for decades. Yeah, sorry, yeah. He, um, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all right. But also, he's, um, what he's attacking is something that we have so called supply management, which is actually something that we put in place to keep uh, our Quebecois dairy farmers, like these small family farms. Right. And, like, it's a thing we did to keep them in business, Protect to keep, them, like, because yeah. um, we actually have a lot of family farms still and farmers markets and stuff, which is uh, nice, but also really expensive. Yeah. Oh no. I mean, it's, it's running a family farm is crazy expensive and not economically viable. No, I mean, I don't know how people actually manage to make a living from farming, right? Because if you have a bad year, your crops don't do that well. Everyone's had a bad year. Um, the prices might go up, but there's not a lot of product. If you have a good year, so of it, so does everybody else in, in the same area and the price goes down. Um, and it's just a hard job. It's 24 hours a day. You've got to milk the cows every morning, every night. Um, there's never a day off, you know, and, um, my grandfather was a farmer and he gave it to my uncle and my uncle couldn't make a go of it. And my grandfather, basically none of his kids wanted to take up farming because it sucks. You know, it's just hard, hard work and there's no health care and there's no retirement plan and there's no paid vacation. And so he ended up um, like doing stuff in order to make it a, a corporation and leasing out the land to another group of people who do want to farm, but it's like a corporation farming. So, yeah, I mean, you guys did the right thing. You protected your family farms 
and we didn't. Yeah, but it also it is um it is expensive. It does cost us a lot. Like we basically do say we're going to buy all your milk whether you whether there's demand for it or not and like we'll buy milk and literally pour it down the drain in order to keep like it's kind of like um like kind of like triple A programs like from the depression mm -hmm. and it just kind of kept going. Uh we also uh, in Saskatchewan which is our like most one of our most rural provinces. It's like just north of Montana and North Dakota. And it has a population of a million people and it's like twice the size. It's like basically the size of both Dakota. They, their solution is basically communist because this place was, this province was actually settled in the early 20th century. So it's really, really young. And they just have all farmers and then a wheat board. And it's a government organization that buys all of the wheat of the entire province and sells it on the international market for them. It's go. like, holy, like, okay. Yeah, it's not, you know, capitalism is not the only way. There are other solutions, you know. And this is, you know, you mentioned a little bit of how about America is divided by class, but I think every other country in the world is far more class conscious of than, than the states, you know, the whole idea that, yeah, you know, you do have to make an effort to protect vulnerable people. Or like in this case, if you want an industry to thrive, then how do you make it work for everybody? Not just make it cutthroat and who can do it at the cheapest cost and for the greatest profit and the le lowest wages with the fewest benefits. Especially for things, because like there's things that the free market just flat out, that like has been exemplified over and over again, the free market just doesn't work for. And it's a handful of things. It's food and healthcare and like, I imagine prisons, like yeah prisons, prisons like roads yeah. uh water utilities <laughs> like in some ways but but definitely prisons and roads don't work as capitalist yeah. based systems yeah I also I think I've been dealing like we got off coal at some point in the recent past as well which is nice yeah, I mean, I was also actually just today thinking because I've got the kind of I bought one of those crappy like so, not crappy because it's you know solar light, but just because it was really inexpensive. Um, one of those solar battery things that you put in your garden plants and then it'll kind of light it up a little bit. Which as it gets darker, it's kind of nice because then I don't have to turn on the lights if I've got the little glow from the solar powered you know lighting or whatever. But it doesn't last for crap. And I just thought if we had put as much money into solar research that we put into coal. Um, think what the battery power could be now. Mm -hmm. Although our, our, our bad sin is that uh, we can do no coal because of our resources, because Northern Ontario is where like almost all of the uranium in North America comes from, and we have Niagara Falls. What about wind farms? Are those becoming increasingly popular, or have they always been in Canada? Um. They've started to pop up in the last decade. Around here, if you get about maybe 90 minutes out of town, there's like a very, like this is a city that is surrounded by basically nothing until you get to like Detroit on one side and and Buffalo on the other. And or and like the GTA, like the Toronto area in another direction. And so this city, you get about 90 minutes out from the, here until the border with Detroit is windmills. And in Saskatchewan, which is like Saskatchewan looks like it could be drawn with a ruler, uh, both from space and on the ground. And it has my, my mom's from Saskatchewan. So I go there a lot. That's why I talk about it so much, but um, they have like some wind company has bought up like one corner of every acre of every farmer's land. And so you can see like every acre for like, like until the horizon there's there's windmills going and so it's it's starting to become a big thing we have a big one in toronto too which i think was more just like a a statement rather than something that can actually work but um yeah but yeah I'm, we don't I've, have yeah yeah uh, i know that you know, i'm seeing them more and more i was in um scotland for a conference in the earlier part of the month and uh, i took a, a drive 
it just ended up saving me time to take a taxi to the airport rather than to try to get all the public transportation. But as a consequence, I got a lovely view of their new Amazon warehouse, this massive new warehouse that they're building to process Amazon products in Scotland. But also I was I kind of like noticed um, quite a few wind farms and some people find them an eyesore. I'm sure people used to find telephone lines an eyesore as well. I still do. But I think they're kind of beautiful and graceful and they just kind of whip around if they're going and if she, if the wind is blowing like why why would we not why it's just it's there it's like the sun like why wouldn't we take advantage of it? it's there it's like a, yeah. yeah scotland's got to get on top of it uh, get on top of wind because solar is just not going to happen there no no you need the wind yeah you're not going to get no no if you've got solar batteries in scotland you're basically the most hopeful person the least realistic one alive yeah <laughs> it's but, not uh, always so bad but yeah, but I like looked at actually like my wife who is American, but she was we were talking about what Ontario's energy mix was, and then I realized it was almost uh, it's like fifty two percent nuclear, and I was like, oh, cool! I forgot that all the uranium is up in the Canadian Shield. Yeah, so. yeah, the Germans are moving more and more away from nuclear. I think there was after Fukuyama the disaster, there was a real big uh, push because the Green Party is a bit more. Um, big here uh, to yeah move off of of nuclear energy. So I think they have a long term plan to get off of that or shut down shut that down. And they're they're huge into green energy. So yeah. But France went all in. Uh, France is like something like eighty plus percent nuclear. Yes, they went on the opposite direction. They went on the glowing direction. Yeah. So they're new. we'll see. You know, there's two different versions of energy policy. We'll see which one wins out as the more sensible mm -hmm. one in the long term. So. I've had so much fun that I didn't realize it's 10 to 11. Yeah, I imagine <laughs> you've had a long day. You've been talking with patrons. You've been, this is your second hangout of the day. This was so fun though. We should do this again and not in like within like three or four months, definitely. As soon as the elect, how about after the election? I'll come sure. out and I can talk can to you talk a little bit about life. what's happening. Yeah, yeah, that would be perfect because I'll be in the field until after the May, June 8th and then I will need like 10 days to recover and then I'll probably be able to talk again. But And uh, when's you, and then that's uh, July time is going to be when you'll be able to come up and like think about other things in your life besides writing, right? Yeah, and I also uh, May and June I'm going to like a digital history or digital humanities uh, workshop for four days and I'm going to... Uh, Mexico for my anniversary, and I'm going to um, VidCon in July, June. So I have to, you know, I, I'm going to be like all over the place. That sounds fantastic. Um, all those things. Yeah, it's going to be good. But uh, once I come out of the woods, then yeah, and see if uh, see if Britain committed suicide while I was gone. Right. It's yeah, like there's, so, there's not yeah. a lot of horrible upsets that could happen except for like UKIP forming government or something weird. But that wouldn't happen. Oh, no, no. I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think, yeah, they've, they don't have that many seats. So <laughs> I don't think, I, I think the kind of UKIP, the uh, raison d'etre, as it were, is kind of their, I guess, making sure they get out of Europe now. But we'll see if their message is quite as powerful post-Brexit as it was pre-Brexit. Because, again, it's always easier to be against something um, than it is to be for something. And uh, to quote George Washington from the musical Hamilton, winning is easy, governing's harder. That's a good way to finish, I think. George Washington <laughs> quote's always good. All right, everyone, subscribers, thank you guys so much for coming out. If you're watching live, this video will go up on my Stepmore Back channel, and I'll try to find some sort of nice clip from our talk to put up on the channel halfway between this, the video that released today and the next video that comes out whenever it comes out. And so thank you so much, Dr. Thank Winters. You. And of course, if you're watching this, Christy Winters, I think that's, that's just your YouTube channel's name, right? Yes, it is. Yep. You, anyone right, well, can come over and check out my stuff, and uh, hopefully yeah, I'll, get, I'll get on that historical Jesus stuff for uh, our July meeting as well. Sweet. All right. Well, have a good night. Uh, Thanks. Good night. And uh, I'll, have a, I'll go. Goodbye. Everybody. Yeah, thank you for everything. All right.